The city of Harrow's rises out of the sea on a great open plain on the southern shores of the Halvinsana. Harrow's through, sorry, Harrow's through less than a century, though less than a century old, has grown to become a rising player in global trade. The head of the Torin company and the new governor of the Harrow's, Alexander Torin, has called for leaders to spread into the heart of the Halvin Sana to tame the land by building new cities and towns loyal to Harrow's. A massive migration has begun as those with wealth and power lead those with a desire to start anew out into the wilds of the countryside to copy the success of Harrow's and expand the tiny city-state into a powerful empire. Most of the patrons are upstanding and wish to only continue the legacy of Harrow's by building thriving villages, temples to the gods of light, and towers for the teaching and responsible use of magic. But other masters have a different view of things. Some of them want power for the sake of power. Others want to spread an old and vile religion. And others just want to watch the world burn, Greg. All of you <laughs> seek the favor of the ancient necromancer and his promise of eternal undeath. To appease the men and women that follow these corrupt leaders out into the wilderness, they must first build a thriving domain, but with an undertone of despair that will slowly take root until at some point, without even knowing, the people will be engulfed in a tide of wickedness and horror. Some may revel their intention or may reveal their intentions early and simply turn on their population right from the beginning. Others may secretly invite trolls, orcs, and dragons to roam in their wilds and prey on the helpless that followed them. But beware, the Torin Company is known far and wide for the brave adventurers that make up its ranks. Your depravity and terrors will become known to members of the legendary company as they meet in places such as the Great Unicorn and Yellow Swan Taverns. Eventually, they will come to put an end to the evil and destroy its hiding places. Can you thrive in darkness or will you succumb to the light? So Dark Domains, is a two to five player game. Accumulate the most favor with from the necromancer and the necromancer is represented as evil or skull tokens in this game. So the goal of the game is victory points but it's really the goal of the game is to collect evil. Hmm. <laughs> Players are tasked with the objective of accruing these evil tokens through the play of building buildings, monsters, and spells and henchmen. To gain these tokens, players will need to gain wealth and purchase resources, but be warned, for the necromancer cares not for gold or trinkets. Only the darkness of your heart wins their favor. All right, so what are we doing in this game? Well, you kind of heard that. So we have the main board here. The main board it consists of 17 different locations in the town or village or city state or whatever you want to call this of Harrow's. So there are 17 worker placement action spaces out here, which sound like a huge amount, but it's actually very intuitive as we go. So what we're going to be doing in this game is we're going to be taking our minions or our workers placing them out here on the board, and then resolving these in numbered spaces, one through 17, and then following this uh, sequence of phases, resolve each of these things. We're going to have to defend ourselves against the various adventurers that are going to come and try and slay us. We're going to do so by building these buildings, acquiring these monsters to help protect our buildings as these adventurers come out and try and destroy them, as well as accruing henchmen to try and help us along the way, as well as last but not least, collecting spell cards that will either help ourselves or possibly hurt our opponents, and building up our own little kind of tableau or another town here. All right, so that's what we're doing. So what we're looking at, like I said, is this board, 17 worker placement spaces, 
and various things that go along with it. So as I mentioned, we have the monsters here. We have henchmen up in these locations. We have two sets of four adventurers a piece. We have the four different types of spells out there. We have the fate deck or fortune deck, which is going to be some sort of thing that will either universally or universally help or hurt us as a individuals, but collectively as a whole. It's also the timer for the game. This is preceded into three different decks of cards in that when the death card, which is somewhere in the bottom five cards, when the death card appears, that will trigger the last round of the game. There is a phase track here, and again, with that aforementioned uh, death card, we will continue doing rounds, and usually there's going to be six to eight rounds in this game. We have the henchmen, over here, and then we have a ton of different resources and various things. So we have elements here for the spell tokens. We have a whole bunch of different uh, resources that we're going to be acquiring, and obviously we have a bank that also is off board. Now there are various other little tokens. As they come up, we'll point those out, and there are also helpful monsters, or not really monsters, but helpful heroes that we may be able to acquire to help defend against the legion of the adventurers out there. And last but not least, there is a replacement, huge amounts of stack of monsters that can come out to refill those. Then our player tableau. So our player tableau consists of four different areas. So there is kind of a forest region, a mountain region, a village or town region, and a plains region over here. Within each of those areas, there are four actual spaces within each area in which we're going to be building these buildings out here. These buildings come on two different sides. They're, when, when they come out into our tableau, they will come out here like this. When we choose to build them, they will come out normally onto the white side. And then possibly as the game advances, we're going to be able to turn them into the dark side, which then the adventurers will come out and try and attack these, okay? Everyone starts with four minions. There may be something in the game that affects to where you only get three or possibly five, a fifth minion. The first player marker and everybody starts with eight bucks. Now, because we didn't use the money in pipeline that comes with the game, we decided, well, fair is fair. We will continue using poker chips here, all right? So that's kind of what you're looking at here in general, all right? But now let's go over the different phases of the game. I think that's going to be the easiest way to teach this. So the first phase is going to be the fortune phase. So the fortune phase is really simple. We're gonna flip over two of these cards. And then if they have, they have different symbols on these cards, and if those symbols match, we're gonna do one part of the card. If the symbols don't match, we're gonna do the other part of the card, and it will happen universally or affect universally whatever needs to happen. Easy enough, moving on. The preparation phase often will get skipped in this game. Preparation phase, basically some of these buildings, some of the spells, and so, or some of the henchmen may have special abilities that may be available to trigger during the preparation phase. If so, somebody will chime up, hey, I'm gonna do something in that phase. If not, we'll just continue moving on down, okay? Now, one other really nice thing about this game, I will say, is each of these phases has a different iconography or a different symbol. So on when a henchman or a spell or something else will trigger, it matches that iconography onto that phase. So it's going to make it really easy to know, oh, I can only play this in a, preparation phase, I can only do it during the adventure phase, etc., etc. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So moving on now to the minion phase. This is one of the two real meat, or one of three meat phases of the game. The minion phase is, well, as you might could guess, when we place our minions. Starting with whoever has the first player token and going in clockwise order, we are going to place one of our minions out onto one of these lighter or these circle spaces out here to represent one of the worker placement action spaces. When we get to the resolution, we'll go through each of these spaces, but there are a whole host of them along with 17 different locations in which we're going to be able to do things, okay? 
that will continue until all of us are out of minions. And then that phase will end. Easy enough. Now the big meat of the game is the resolution phase. And the resolution phase is when we actually resolve all of our minions that are out here on the board. So as it is right now, there's going to be 16 minions between the 17 locations, okay? So the first space is going to be a zero space and is not actually on the board. I'm going to double back to that at the end of the resolution phase to give a little bit of context because as it is right now, you don't understand any of this. So the zero space won't matter because you don't understand what you're doing. So I'll double back to that. Zero space, so in the domains, which is our player boards, this will resolve first though. So moving now into the first location is the seer. The seer says, you look at the top three fortune cards, put them back in any order secretly and put it back. Easy enough. So basically you get to see the future, see what's coming. In our plays of the game, honestly, haven't seen this used a whole lot so far. So that is the seer. I'm going to continue on unless somebody has questions, you guys can interrupt me. Moving on to the business district, get two bucks. So this is the money symbol in the game, so get two dollars. Easy enough. Moving on now to the number three space. Skulls are evil, get two points. This tends to be a lot more used towards late game or maybe you have some sort of spell or henchman that accents that or enhances that. So there are two spaces obviously for those. Moving on to the fourth and fifth spaces. These are very, very similar. The assassin and the street thug, okay? What these are is if you choose the assassin's guild, you're gonna pay 12 bucks or discard six evil. That's six points. That is prohibitively expensive or any mix of these that would equate to 12 money. So each evil that you discard equates to two money, okay? So if you were to pay $4, and for evil, that would work out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The math work out there? Yep. When you do so, you can do one of three things. You can either remove somebody's minion that hasn't resolved yet from that space. Oh, Edward, you think you're going to get resources? No, you're not. You're going to go somewhere else. So the good news is when you take that off, I get to place this onto a different location that hasn't resolved but nonetheless, I can't do what that was, okay? The other two options are, as players accumulate henchmen, which can be very beneficial for the player that has them, you can kill and just remove from the game one of those henchmen. Or you can destroy or remove, kill, fill in the right word, one of the adventurers. Because when we get there, I'll explain why you might want to remove a certain adventure as opposed to the one or another. Any questions about that? The street thug works the exact same, except you only pay two bucks. But then you see you have to roll a die. And here you only have a 33% chance of succeeding because you only succeed if you roll a one or a two. So if you roll a three through six, you just wasted the two bucks and the minion and you don't get to take the action. So cheaper, more risk, or I'm sorry, cheaper and more risk or guaranteed doing something. I mean, they're not as highly trained. Those right, they're street yeah. thugs versus yeah. assassins. Mm -hmm. Yeah! Might right. work, might not. Right. So the next space now is the Architects Guild. You'll notice that there are seven buildings available in which to be acquired. To acquire them requires this. That. I'm going to acquire that building. Notice I did not say build. I'm going to acquire. Basically think of it as these are the plans for when you acquire them. So when we resolve, we will actually take that building and place it over here to then possibly be built later on when we get to the foreman phase to be able to place it out here on our board. But all you're doing is taking the plans to be able to do so. All right, any questions on that? Nope. Good. 
I said I would just continue on unless you stop me. I will do that. <laughs> so there are obviously one space per building. So a specific, if you want a particular building, put it on the matching space. Easy enough. Everybody also sees what the next building available is going to be. I will go through the details of the anatomy of these when we get to the next phase. Moving over here to these two spaces, which is the Wayward Dragon Inn. I guess a dragon just was wayward, meandering, and there you go. What these two are is acquire that henchman. You take the card into your tableau and do whatever the special ability is when it is available. So notice this one here has a matching symbol for the foreman phase on it. The foreman phase here. So if you acquire that henchman, you may be able to do whatever it says during that phase. Easy enough. So you either choose that foreman or you choose that foreman, your choice. And obviously all of these are worker placement spaces, so not multiple players can go to them. One minion per spot. And as I say that, I'm now going to break that rule and go to the Builder's Guild. The Builder's Guild, space number eight, notice it is a much bigger circle than these. Any guesses as to why? Because it's an infinite maw. There we go. So. A anybody can go there, as many as you want, etc., etc. Now, the game does point out that this is not a resource-tight game. I would argue that point, or maybe I should just play better, but you <laughs> should have copious amounts of resources in which to do things. Here is how you're going to acquire various types of resources. Notice I said resources and not elements. Resources are going to be for building buildings. Elements are going to be for casting spells, potentially. So here, pay one buck, get two wood, one stone, or two workers, which I find really funny that workers are a resource. You use them and discard them. Well, yeah. Because we're evil. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that, that kind of humor there, okay? Or, and you can do this, you could pay $5 and get 10 workers, or any mix of that as you wish. It's unlimited based on only how much money you have. Next, the other option here is pay $2 to be able to get two, I believe that's metal. Yeah, that's a I'm sorry, one, one metal. metal. Two bucks for one metal, okay? Which is, again, a building resource for building buildings, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, moving on. Now, the Towers of the Elements, as you might could guess, allows you to acquire two elements. Resources, elements. And which space, there are four of them, dictates what type of element you're going to get. Now, each element, earth, wind, fire, and water, earth, wind, fire, and water, you're going to get two of them depending on what space you go to. Moving on. The tenth space, there are two available. It says, take any three spell cards that you wish. Now, I do, obviously, as you can see, there are four different types of spells available over there. Now, the spells that you choose have to do with what it is that you're trying to do with them. This deck is an attack deck. Pretty self-explanatory. You're going to attack, be it other players, uh, their, their buildings, their monsters, or possibly adventurers. Defense, well, probably to protect the stuff that you have built. Next is control. Control, this one's a little bit more general. It will allow you to do special abilities that don't fit in well with the other three decks. And the last one is, uh, produce or um, like resource, gain resources, gain things, gain items type things. Okay? All right, moving on. You get three of them, and I do not believe that there is a hand limit on the number of spells that you can have. I did not see one. Right. All right. So moving on to the 11th space, and can you read that uh, the name for me? The Wait. Green Unicorn Tavern. Thank you. It allows you to replace any member of the adventuring party connected with that specific tavern, i.e. those four. However, you are not allowed to replace the leader. If you want to replace the leader, might I suggest you hire an assassin, or possibly a street thug allows you to knock out the leader. Now the leader is always going to be the leftmost 
in those two spaces. So the 11th and 12th space, those four, those four. Otherwise, they're identical. I will go over the details as to why any of that matters when we get to the adventure phase. Okay, just know that you can kill any of those six if you wish to. Okay? Now, anybody that is removed, so out of those six from those two locations, is discarded and immediately replaced. So you're not lessening the amount of adventurers. But you'll notice maybe in the top right hand corner of each of those, there is a number with a color behind it. Might I draw your attention to the handy dandy little dice that are in the tray? Eight, 10, and 12 sided dice respectively. So you maybe you get rid of a 12 sided die and possibly replace it with an eight sided die adventurer later on. All right, so that's 11 and 12. Moving on now, if you can help me out moving uh, my meeple, I'm sorry, my minion, over to the docks. The docks allows you to take the foreign mercenary token and you get to keep it until the end of that turn. And when you do so, you're gonna place it on a space and probably a space that has a building on it, which we will explain more in detail because the number, the die in the top right hand corner, which in this case is a 10 sided die, he's going to help you protect it, okay? All right, so think of him kind of as a temporary monster in which he's going to help you protect. Now, moving over to number 14, the Far Lands. You remember back here, where, uh, back in the Wayward Dragon Inn where you could claim one of the two henchmen? It's the exact same here, except it's a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> so choose top card, bottom card. Okay, so if those, are, if those are there, somebody's already taken it, might I suggest if you want a henchman going up there? So that's space number 14. Now, moving on to number 15 is the Nickmarg. There are all of these spaces available which correspond to these monsters, whether it's a chimera, a troglodyte, which I always thought a troglodyte was actually a caveman, but I digress. Water elemental, dragon, etc., etc. Those these are going to help you protect your buildings from those evil adventurers. And by evil adventurers, I mean the good doers, people, guys. <laughs> the cost to hire them, or to buy them, or to conjure them, or fill in the right word, is the number in the bottom right-hand corner. So that is in coins, so whether it, right now it looks like three to six as to what's on there. And just like the buildings, where you are, says what monster you're going to claim. The number in the top right is going to be their defense value. Notice a water, water elemental has a defense of 16, whereas the troglodyte only has a defense of eight. But notice he costs twice as much. In addition to that, there's going to be probably, maybe, some special ability on that monster, which we will go over here in a little bit, as well as a resource generating or possibly evil generating resource, meaning victory point, in the bottom left-hand corner, which will come in during production, okay? All right, the other thing that I wanna point out is when we resolve these during resolution, when you take these, they immediately go on to a space on your board. It can go on to an empty space or onto a building, okay? And I'll go through the details of all this in a little bit. Just know that it comes as opposed to the buildings which come out here, which must be built, monsters just come straight onto your board. Moving on to number 16 over here is the Harrowstown Council. So you might be asking yourself, wait, Harrowstown Council looks a whole lot like the business district. Get two bucks. Aha. But notice the little flag. I'm sorry. Notice the little dude below. I apologize. The little dude looks a lot like this. Become the first player and get two bucks. Okay? All right. There is one spot left, and that is the royal court. Again, get two bucks. And also, get an extra worker. It's a temporary worker. You're only going to have it for the next turn because obviously you don't get it until it resolves and that's the last space in which it resolves. When you do, you're gonna take the worker and you're just gonna set this up here as a reminder, hey, who had the courtesan? Oh, I did, so I get to use it. But if somebody goes there, they're going to take the courtesan and then when it resolves, then they will get the courtesan back. Easy enough? So 
Any questions on any of the 17 spaces other than a couple of details about the adventures and such? No? Good. Moving on. Coming on down now. Moving on down to Foremanville. Thank you. That was driving me nuts. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. So the Foreman phase. Now, and let's say, for argument's sake, uh, I acquired this building here and this building. Uh, hold on a moment. Yeah, that'll work. These two buildings. Okay. So I'm going to actually go ahead and bring it over so you guys can see this a little bit more in detail here. So give me just a moment. There we go. You guys only need to see one of them. So during the Foreman phase, all players can build any buildings from their play area provided they have the required resources. So what do we have here? So we have its defense value right now of one. We have the requirements in which to build, which is one wood and one worker. So in other words, I would need those two, there we go, need those two resources in which to build that building. And then when it's built during the income phase, you're going to get one buck. Easy enough. Much, very similar here. So there we go. So now this has a uh, defense of nine, but notice that it has a requirement here that it must be built in a mountain region on your board. Okay, so again, just as a quick reminder, on your board you have mountain, forest, village, and plains, so obviously that one would have to be built down here. The uh, building requirements are considerably more on this one, but however, you're going to get two metal every time it produces. Now this symbol we're going to overlook for right now until we talk about the adventure phase, but just know that these symbols do matter. And then this over here on the right hand side is if it turns to the dark side, which will happen later, the uh, income is going to change from this to that. And same goes here, going from $1 to a fire element and a victory point. Okay, so you're going to be able to build any and all buildings that you have in your tableau onto the light side during this phase. So you will spend whatever the resources are, and the mines say that will go there, and maybe I put the farm, you know, in the field. That kind of makes sense. I would spend those resources back to the supply. Thank you, supply. And boom, that is the foreman phase. And everyone's going to do that simultaneous. Any questions on the foreman phase? Nope. nope. All right. I'm actually going to skip the adventure phase for right now and move on to production. Production is, okay, produce. What do you get on the left-hand side of your buildings or the left-hand side of your monsters? Okay, easy enough, get all your stuff. Unless one of the fortune or the fortune cards say, hey, don't do that, or get bonus, or whatever it is, okay? Then the end of turn phase is basically just a little bit of cleanup, and that is all players, anybody that has end of turn actions, gets to do again with that symbol on it. Then once those actions have been carried out, we have to reset the board, which is we're going to discard the fortune cards. We're going to remove any unavailable tokens because the fortune cards may tell us a certain area is unavailable, so on and so forth. We're going to put any henchman cards that are left here, turn them face up over here and refresh those face down. And then Fill any empty building cards over here. So notice if those were the only building cards that were there or that were taken, those two would refill at that point. We're going to fill any vacancies, i.e. replace for any adventurers that may have been removed or died in their adventurers, and replace the mercenary, replace the courtesan, replace the monsters, and then... If anybody ever has more than 10 of any one resource, you now discard down to 10 at that point, okay? Easy enough? All right, so now let's go over the adventuring. The adventuring is honestly the thing that sets this game apart from just your standard worker placement game, but also is the most complex, but it's really not complex at all. So 
and I love this part in the rule book, the scourge of your existence and the only barriers to your plans are the Torian company. These pesky do-gooders will seek out evil, well, your evil, and try and eradicate it from the land. Your success hinges on respecting them and preparing for them. So what's going to happen is this adventure party is going to adventure forth first, then this one will. That will happen every turn unless there are any fortune cards that say otherwise, okay? These guys are going to target, finish their adventure, then these guys are going to target and finish their adventure. The reason that matters is it's possible that they may try and target the same thing, but these guys might destroy what that would target, so therefore this would target something else, if that makes sense. Okay, all right. So how do we do it? First off, we have to determine the target for that party. All right, and we're, go we're going to now, let me have one of those cards, the leader, actually. Let me zoom out just a hair here. All right, so now we're going to look at the leader. So the leader has a bunch of symbols on it, as you can see. This is the die that he's going to roll against you, okay? Male or female, because there might be certain uh, effects that affect males versus females. Then these two symbols. This one is going to be the primary. This is always going to be the secondary symbol. Okay. The primary symbol on the left is going to dictate what it's going to be. So there are two different shapes. You'll notice there is a diamond shape and a hex shape. The diamond shape is going to target a specific region on a player's board. The regions, again, being these symbols right here, okay? If there is no valid target that matches this, then we will go to the secondary, and the secondary is going to affect a building type. And now let me go ahead and bring your attention back now and show you guys this. The building type here, right there, notice that those two match. This could be trouble for my poor little farm. Or it could be a good thing, actually, which we'll get into in a little bit. So they're always going to target, oh, and there's one other huge detail, I apologize. The number of the building, oops, let's try this. There. The number of the building right there is going to be a hugely important thing for when there's multiple of a type that matches. So again, if I've built this over here in the plains area, what's going to happen is they are going to target the highest number available in that, starting with dark buildings. Because dark is evil, they're trying to eradicate evil. So, this is a lot of words. Let's try this. Here we go. So this leader is going to target all buildings, or a building specifically, in that region. We're going to look at all four of our tableaus. Who has a dark building in that region? I do. Okay, hey, guess what? If you're the only one who has a dark building in that region, they're gonna target that. However, if we both, ha if we both did, we're then going to look at who has the highest number? I have number 32. I have 144. Yours would be higher, so they're going to target your building. If, flip that over, please. Okay. Does anybody have a dark building in that region? No. Does anybody have a light building in that? Check that. Dark building. Dark building. Light building. Light building. So, then, does anybody have a coin dark building? No. Then we will come back, does anybody have a light building in that region? If the, oh, we both do. Okay, again, 132, you have a higher number. So, hey, these are light buildings. It's a place for them to go out and adventure and rest. You get a buck. Congrats. <laughs> the end, that's the, that's the extent of their adventuring party. If it's a light building, they're actually positive. But that's no fun. So let's just, for argument's sake, say this is the only dark building out there. So they have targeted a building. So now, all four of those guys are going to come out and come after me. So now that we have determined the target, 
what's going to happen is they're going to try and attack. So check the leaders. Uh, we've already done all that. Okay. Sorry, lost my place. So targeting now. Once a target's been determined, every token in building space on the space is subject to the attack. So what does that mean? Let's go ahead and say I had this kobold orc. I had placed it during the, the placement phase. I had placed it over here. So now I have a total defense of nine, okay? If the target were a lone monster, so let's say it were like this, he would target the monster because he's in that region by himself. Easy enough, but as it is, they will always target buildings before monsters. If a monster shares a space with a building card or other token, everything in that space will be attacked, even if it's a light building because monsters are bad, okay? So what's going to happen is they're going to roll dice. But beforehand, does anybody want to play a spell starting with the targeted player? So if I have any defense spells, maybe be, now be a good time to play them. And there may be any special rules that apply to that, etc., etc. Then we can go around. Does anybody else want to play any spells? You guys could either do it to hurt me or possibly to hurt the attackers. Okay? Any questions on that? Then they're going to roll. Okay. And by they, I mean I have to roll my own attackers. So what do we got here? We got two eight-sided and two ten-sided. There we go. We rolled. Um, is that number bigger than nine? A little bit. A little, a little bit. bit. Yeah. <laughs> okay, done. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Plan better. Ouch. You saw what's coming. Plan better. Yep. Okay? Now, if you didn't like that leader, now might I reference, if I may, here, because maybe you don't want him to attack that area. Kill him. <laughs> if they kill, everything slides to the left, and now it'll be that one becomes the leader. And then if that's dead, that one becomes the leader, etc., etc. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After that attacks, the leader goes away, whether it's a successful attack or a successful uh, defense. So let's go through, let's say they defeated me. If the party was victorious, everything gets removed from the building space and they're out of the game. And then we're going to replace the party leader because you know what, he died in, or he, he, he retired victorious or whatnot. If I had won, if I had successfully defended, I get three points or three evil and the party leader goes away because, you know, shame or maybe more likely death. He, he died. <laughs> then, and this is important, keep him out there real quick for everyone to see. Replace all other adventure party members that shared the icon that determined the targets. So if it had used the coin symbol, he would also have died. So he would go as well as the leader. Slide to the left and refill left or right. Then this party will do the exact same thing, rinse and repeat. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. And what if they don't end up adventuring at all? Then the leader goes away. The leader is going away. Moral of the story. <laughs> okay. However, now I've lost production, etc., etc. The only other thing that I want to point out was this thing a special ability here on some of the monsters says if you want for every water token that you discard you can roll a d10 in defense in addition to whatever the defense is but you have to determine that ahead of time oh I'm gonna get rid of three water tokens and roll three d10s okay easy enough and then obviously that will subtract from the number and if that number isn't greater than your defense then you win you protect yourself and that is adventuring. Any questions on that? Nope. All right, let's play the game. All right, cool. All right, easy enough. Let's reset. And w one other thing that I'm going to try and do. Drag your land. Hmm? Oh, 
Well, I'm kind of No, you don't get that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to actually, and monsters also have a hierarchy here as well for numbering. So I'm actually going to put them uh, low number to high. Because they only uh, refill when they're taken. Yeah, I like the buildings. Oh, yeah, that does make it easy to make a choice. It does. I figure. Maybe. Okay. All right. So place your bets.